thank you for joining us uh, today. Today marks the inaugural event of our Civic Engagement Project by the Department of Politics, Policy, and Administration. Um, this is sort of our soft launch event, so we're glad you can, can open this up with us. The series is being cre um, created to promote and facilitate opportunities for WU students, staff, faculty, and members of the community at large to participate in deliberative dialogue and engage learning in order to cultivate stronger, more inclusive communities. We're planning um, larger events uh, next year and then hopefully a monthly speaker series. Uh, so stay tuned for some events. Um, and then we also will have another speaker coming in either April or May, so pay attention for that event. So, and I have the honor today of introducing our speaker today, Greg Leo. And I, we have a catchy title of the How to Get a Hummingbird to Listen. And when we started talking with him about what this would be, I, we're still curious whether or not Greg is the hummingbird or the legislators he works with are the hummingbirds. So maybe he can clarify for that as we're, as we're talking, because I'm... I think we misunderstood what he said or he, anyway, so we're curious who the hummingbird is. Um, but Greg has a very distinguished career with over 50 years of advocacy. Um, he began, and that, I think that'd be interesting for current students at the University of Oregon, um, um, advocating for students at the Oregon legislature. Um, he then went on to work for a time in Washington, D.C. in the Reagan White House, and then has been back in Oregon I don't know how, the number of years, but I think it's important if you hear the different people. So he's had clients including corporations, nonprofits, local governments, and Native American tribes, I think, and among others as well. So he's advocated for a lot of different groups. Um, so welcome, Greg. Thank you, everyone. We're going to talk about advocacy and, you know, just wanted to kind of set the stage for uh, what I've done in my career. and basically so students can think about what is possible in their careers and what you can do going forward. So I want to uh, give that kind of as the overall theme. The hummingbird is a great metaphor, though, um, for people and for things that do, that are effective, that make things happen. So the original quote that Mary heard in my civics presentation at Wilsonville was that we have to have a you know, really a great care when we talk to legislators because they have a hummingbird's attention span. So just so you don't think that I'm saying something negative about uh, legislators, I want to just kind of push this analogy just a little bit. And you will see I'm going to torture this metaphor here, so forgive me for that. But she is small but mighty, persistent and energetic. Her wings beat between 750 and 5,000 times a minute. Her heart beats up to 1,200 beats per minute in flight. She can fly over 30 miles an hour. She can migrate thousands of miles, traveling with the seasons to pursue nectar and insects, and she can live for a decade. Her focus is pure. She must consume half her body weight a day in nectar. In the process, she pollinates shares what is necessary for new life between her sources of energy and symbiotic sharing, often, pollute, or often pollinating flowers that bees cannot. She's, uh, she is an essential contributor to the life cycle of the earth, of the environment in which she lives. The hummingbird is the only bird that can fly backwards, knowing that she has to do what's necessary to succeed. She must have the fluid ability to persist and navigate to overcome obstacles to succeed. She's the only vertebrate who can hover. With all these skills, she can be fierce in defending her own territory. She is diverse with 330 species worldwide. She's a native of the new world. Her many unique skills have developed over time to give her the ability to thrive in an ever-changing world. To see her iridescent beauty in motion requires a discerning eye. Seemingly still, watch closely to see the energy, action, grace, and purpose with which she moves from flower to flower, collecting nectar, the stuff of energy in this cycle of life. We aspire to the energy and focus of the hummingbird. She is her own best advocate, and she earned what she earns through hard work and focus in her unique place in the world. This is why we picked the hummingbird. So, B 
be, we celebrate the hummingbird because of all of these various qualities. So when I say that a legislator um, has an attention span of a hummingbird, it, it's not a criticism of you know, inability to focus. It's about what legislators have to do. They go from issue to issue in the blink of an eye. And sometimes they'll need to vote you know, on between 20 and 30 issues a day. There are thousands of pages of testimony sometimes on very complicated bills. So you have to go through all of those uh, different processes to know how to decide because they have great responsibility. They're there deciding for the rest of us about what the policy should be. So uh, in working with legislators, we don't waste their time. We make sure that we are ready uh, when we talk to them to give them a quick burst of information, which is informed and respectful, but it's got to be on target, or else you just won't listen. So I've just put together a few slides here. So in 50 years, I've worked in federal, state, and local government. I've worked primarily for the executive branch, but as a lobbyist with the uh, legislative branch. So in the federal government, I was the director of congressional and public affairs for the Immigration Service when we did the amnesty in 1986, and we set up the um, Employer Sanctions Program. So I spent seven intensive years working on essentially one bill. So, and that was the Immigration Reform and Control Act in 86. So when it comes to the immigration, I had the opportunity to kind of work deeply in the material, uh, meet many of the advocates, and I'm just really proud to say I knew Dolores Huerta, whose you know, picture's outside the door here. And she, uh, with the National Council of La Raza, was absolutely one of the best, most effective advocates I've ever seen. She was really hard to say no to. <laughs> you know? So uh, in the course of being in Washington, D.C., uh, and working for the U.S. Justice Department, you know, we had to deal with the quintessential American issue about who will be new Americans. And it was uh, questions of what is the national interest, but when you break down that question, it was about many different policies, humanitarian policy, labor policy, economic. Uh, there was some national security aspects to it. It was like a composite of many different issues. And so they gave us an opportunity. So by contrast, when leaving the federal uh, government, I went to Harvard. Uh, to the Kennedy School, got my master's degree at Harvard, and then came back to Oregon to work in the Oregon legislature, where I was administrator of the House Rules Committee. And um, we would handle, in that office, maybe 30 bills a day when we were busy. So in the federal world, you took years to work through every detail of an issue, because hey, we had a lot of people in the policy process uh, across town. I mean, Washington is really a village of you know, different uh, policymakers. Whereas Salem, you had to be a generalist. And as a committee administrator, I would need to write a staff member summary that was so perfectly fair that neither side, even in a hotly debated issue, could say this was wrong or right or you know, this report misrepresents a point of view. So it has to cut through any of the points of contention to the, to the facts. So one of my points I want to make here is how does a high performance advocate put together the arguments? So in order to make that hummingbird sized statement, we need to do several things. First of all, I think we need to be a subject matter expert. We need to understand that issue. We need to have a really deep research. And then we need to distill Sometimes it'll be hundreds of pages of documents into one or two sentences because they don't have time to hear the details, okay? So the understanding of the subject matter is critically important. In the political world, do we have any poli-sci majors in this uh, room here today? We have to understand the political context, you know? You have to understand, you know, what the Democrats are thinking, what the Republicans are thinking, how those folks might think about that issue because with every public policy issue, there's a political edge. There's something about it which is political, which is based on values, you know, how people feel about that particular issue. And so understanding that larger context is critical. 
Also, it creates opportunity and access. So access is a critical factor for an advocate. If you can't get in the door to make the presentation, you'll never be able to get the vote, you know, or make the sale if you think of it that way. So having an understanding of the context gives you opportunity and access, and it's all part of how that system works. And finally, the other circle here is what I call good tradecraft, which is, you know, I believe a good advocate needs to be able to communicate on paper and in person and in many, many different ways. So being able to draft a press release on short notice, uh, talking points, uh, being able to brief somebody on the phone quickly where you can't have necessarily eye contact. These days it's about being on Zoom calls. I mean, during the legislative session, I've been on Zoom calls with 50 other lobbyists. Try to get a word then edgewise with those guys, huh? I mean, they all have a point of view. So um, we have to be good at the basics of what we do, you know, and that's what I call the skill set or trade, trade craft. So as we're honing our hummingbird's message here, we're taking all of those ingredients, like we're baking a great cake, and we're combining them into enough uh, knowledge of the environment, specific knowledge about the subject matter, and then have the skills and ability to distill that down into something a policymaker will hear. We do this with the emphasis for nonprofits. And I want to put in a word for nonprofits here. So change in the world happens on the margins. So if we think about the Earth and how the sun comes to the Earth, most of the growth in our oceans are actually in the first 30 feet. In fact, on, this, on the surface, the soil of the Earth, most of the growth will happen at the surface. And in the policy world, it's at those places, those junctures, that change will actually happen. So that's why we are always in a uh, condition of flux, of movement, because growth will happen where there is change and uh, there at the margins. So if sometimes it seems a bit chaotic, it is, because change is messy. Wow. And don't we know that from all the changes we've seen in our lives during the last two years? So nonprofit organizations are organized to identify emerging community needs and then meet those needs. And that's why we focus on nonprofits. So you know, I'm a guy who worked for governments. And you know, a lot of times, governments are kind of clumsy. They're hard to get moving. Uh, it, it, you know, to get a response to an emerging problem, public problem or issue, a lot of times, they, they're slow at getting in the first gear, much less second gear. Nonprofits can go from first gear to fourth gear quickly. And in doing so, that's where you initiate policy change. And so choosing nonprofits as the area that we work with is the one where we think you, as an advocate, can do the greatest amount of good in the shortest amount of time. So we're going to today do a little exercise. And we're going to be preparing to be in front of this committee here. So this is room 50 in the Oregon State Capitol. Probably that's the Rules Committee. Has anybody been in this room? Yeah, OK. So you know what I mean. It's like you're in the basement of the Capitol. You're in this room. There's a historic flag in the room that was flying over the Capitol when the Capitol burnt in 19, what, 36, 37, something like that. And so it's kind of daunting, I have to say, to sit at the dais, or not the dais, but sit at the witness table and actually talk to the members. And then you get three minutes, maybe three minutes. This last short session, we had people giving testimony in two minute increments, which was really hard to do. So let's prepare for getting that together. So in order to do that, I want to kind of go to the interactive part of today's presentation and have you pick an issue. So what's an issue for you? that's top of mind, that you'd like to see the world change in that direction? Climate change, OK? So we want to address the question of climate change. So help me kind of develop this issue a little bit. Let's, let's kind of describe the context. Where are we on the climate right now? Sure, we're currently in a climate crisis, and I hope to see the Oregon legislature address it in a bold and uh, dynamic way right now. Right. 
So one thing we might do is try to you know, control energy policy in the way that we don't burn fossil fuels and release hydrofluorocarbons, which create greenhouse gases. Right, so specifically, how shall we do? How shall we do that? Give me a little sharper policy focus here. Sure, you could do it in maybe three to five prioritized steps, including uh, carbon sequestration. It's hard for me to say that. Carbon sequestering could yeah. be one of our steps because we're Oregon. Um, incentives for regular citizens to make changes in their lives, including incentives for buying electric cars or. Et cetera. Solar Perfect. panels. Perfect. Okay, that, that is great. So we've taken the issue of climate, which is literally global. I mean, it's a big issue, right? But we are going to narrow this down. We're going to talk about carbon sequestration. So we're going to find ways that or change policies to be able to take carbon out of the atmosphere. So in order to do that, we're going to be looking at uh, developing carbon sinks, right? So Eastern Oregon is this vast... Um, Geography, where there's some areas to make carbon sinks. Uh, okay, you've done a great job framing the issue. Let's go to some other people in the room here. How are we going to get the Oregon legislature to create a policy of carbon sinks to deal with, with our global warming? Are you asking me how we're going to motivate them? or No, we... what specific policy or thing do we want to change in order to create carbon sinks? Uh, that's a great question. <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'm not, not uh, going to be well versed on what we can do, but the, yeah. potentially we could ask them to incentivize landowners to let us cr use their property. Perfect. I okay. love that. That's great. great. So we want to create incentives. So how can state government provide an incentive to eastern Oregon landowners to provide for carbon sinks? What are our tools? What are the policy levers? What are those things that government could do to encourage this uh, action on a better climate? Isn't the biggest tool we have the state budget? Yes. Very good. I've heard tax credits. So if you're a property owner, uh, what kind of taxes do you pay? How, how do you pay taxes? Property taxes, right. So they have an assessed valuation on the amount of you know, money government needs from you in order to run government. And then you have a certain amount of land that's assessed at a certain value. And then once a year in October, you probably get a tax bill. Likely, you get a tax bill and you're going, oh my gosh, it's more expensive every year. You know, every year somebody's adding some kind of operating levy or capital levy or, oh my gosh, always more expensive. So if you say, hmm, I got some land that I'm paying property taxes on that the state wants to be able to take that land and use it to sink carbon back in the earth in order to stop global warming, stop the melting of the ice caps, the rising of the seas, then I could get a possible tax credit on that, right? Okay, so I think we have what's called a legislative concept. So a legislative concept is that idea that we have that we're gonna bring into the public policy arena and we're gonna advocate for. So if we have this, uh, what, what's the next thing we probably need? First of all, let me show you the people you need to convince here. So this is the Oregon legislature, all 90 members. And you can see little R's and N's. That's not party affiliation. That is whether or not they've resigned or whether or not they're not running for office. I will say about a third of this body is going to not be here next, um, next time around. Because some members just said, hey, I've done my public service. I'm going to go home now. Some members are saying, no, I'm going to run for a higher office. In this case, let's see, I think I have the number in my pocket here. We have 36 candidates for governor. Today, 36 candidates, we have 19 Republicans, 17 Democrats, many of whom, well, at least, not many, but at least three or four of them have been members of this body. But these are specifically the people we need to address. And so the next thing we want to do is find what's called a legislative champion. So we've had an excellent start on our issue here. We've developed some basic issue understanding. We're going to address global warming issue. We're going to try to find some carbon sinks. We're going to try to find some information on this. So for example, and I'm going to do this to people in class, so get ready for this one. But 
I'm, when I say the words knowable fact, grab your phone and Google the, the fact, and then let me know what that fact is. So, for example, if I said, how much land is in eastern Oregon? That's a knowable fact. And everything we try to do when we develop public policy is fact and research based. So um, you might Google, for example, what kind of carbon sinks are already in eastern Oregon? That would be an important question. Uh, who's doing carbon sinks in eastern Oregon? Are there people or organizations that uh, wanted to do carbon sinks but couldn't because there were barriers to their ability to go forward with carbon sinks? So what we're trying to do is, first of all, develop information from publicly available sources. And so when I started in this business back in the uh, mid-70s, we had rotary dial telephones. Oh my gosh, you may have seen those in the movies, but they were like these kind of heavy boxes that you had this dial thing and you would like, that's how you call people. And then when we typed, we had typewriters and we would you know, put in two or three pieces of paper with carbon paper in between them. And if you made a mistake, you, a lot of times you just kind of tore it out and you started to type all over again. Anybody remember that other than me? So having these incredible computers in your pocket, which has more computing power than what the, the guys in Apollo 11 had, you know, is amazing. So what I'm trying to tell you as an advocate, use your resources to look up those questions. So public information sources, start with Google, then go to state sources. So one question that I would want to ask is, has there been a previous bill on this? So we know we had a great big uh, energy, or, uh, uh, bill, uh, carbon bill uh, in 2020, uh, 2018. 2018, if you remember House Bill 2020, which was the uh, basically you know about the environment and about uh, trying to control carbon generally uh, through through a tax on carbon, basically a tax on fuels, that ground the legislature to a stop, and the Republicans walked out. If you remember that, and that's why they couldn't legislate over this very issue. So someplace in the bill file and House Bill 2020 from that session, there will be somebody talking about carbon, uh, you know, carbon uh, sequestration. So one of the things I would want to do is go on OLIS. This is an amazing resource. Every citizen should have this as their, you know, like this is, this is the sword you're going to fight the battle with. In OLIS, to bills and laws, and you can look into all the laws of the state of Oregon and uh, bills from previous sessions. So you go to the session where we talked about you know, the House Bill 2020, and we would go through that bill file, and we would look for evidence of carbon sequestration. And no doubt, there will be the Eastern Oregon you know, Climate Action Alliance who will have a piece of testimony in there. Or, I'm, you, I'm just making that up, but there is going to be somebody like that who, in the course of this previous debate, has said something about carbon. So this tool is amazingly robust. And everybody who's an active, participating citizen in Oregon needs to know how to use this tool. The lucky thing is, it's pretty darn easy to use. And even an old guy like me who didn't grow up with computers can use it. I can go on OLIS, look stuff up. Curiosity, if you are curious about any issue that, that Oregon addresses, you can go on here and read, read about it. So this is amazing. So I, I would like to encourage you all to wiki walk here a little bit and spend a, a cold rainy evening in OLIS just reading the bill files and look under the testimony tab and you will be amazed at what you find in there. There's also legislative reports. So it could be that the Committee on Energy and Environment, which is likely the committee that our legislative concepts can have jurisdiction on, will have a report about carbon alternatives that we can look for and probably find in there. So how do we recruit our champion? So when I say a champion, I mean a legislator who is going to put their name on the bill as a chief sponsor or legislators who will you know, actually sign on the bill saying that they support the bill. 
So in that very bill file, we will see who the chief sponsor of other bills like this have been, and that's where I would start. So that's a public information source. And the other one that I want to just quickly talk about is OLIS. So everybody knows that money is the kind of mother's milk of politics in a way. It's the way that uh, people get enough money to get their messages out in campaigns. So that is all publicly transparent in Oregon. So you can go on OLIS. You can see who your um, legislator's major contributors are. And through that, kind of deduce what their interests might be. And then the other uh, kind of publicly available source is I would go to the Oregon League of Conservation Voters who publish a scorecard every session about uh, how legislators have voted on the environment. If they're 80% or better, they're probably going to be somebody who will talk to you about carbon uh, sequestration. So out of that, all of those sources, we would then go to human intelligence. And this is where you pick up the phone and you call the political director for the League of Conservation Voters and you say, hey, I'm really interested in having a, you know, a bill next session about the carbon sequestration in Eastern Oregon, right? And who do you think would be interested in that? And they will go, Karen Power would be interested in that. She was the sponsor of the last climate bill in 2020. So that's where you call up Representative Power, who unfortunately has just left the legislature, just announced she's not running for re-election, but that's another issue. That's about whether or not public employees should get child care for serving in the legislature, which is an important issue. But even as a former legislator, if you went to Karen Power and just said to her, hey, what do you know about carbon sequestration in Eastern Oregon? She could probably say, well, here's two or three things you might look into. So we always go to human sources of intelligence. Because as human beings, there are other people who think like us about issues, might share the same values, and might have more experience. And what does Sir Isaac Newton say? He says, we see farther because we stand on the shoulders of giants. So no matter where you are, there is somebody who's probably been on that trail before you. And that's the person you want to get together to help develop uh, that information. And then finally, you get to the hard part, which is writing your policy brief. So I always like to say two pages max, but what in two pages would you say describes your legislative concept? So you, you write up your legislative concept that says, you know, it's kind of like a problem solution statement. The problem is the earth, you know, is degrading because of, you know, environmental, poor environmental stewardship, particularly related to carbon. And the solution is the fine carbon sequestration in eastern Oregon. And we believe that tax policy could be a lever in order to help improve the environment. This is Orstar. So if you want to know what's going on in politics, follow the money. And it's all there. So we pulled up uh, Peter Courtney's, you know, Peter Courtney was an amazing legislator, Oregon's longest serving legislator. He is brilliant. I personally love the fact he's a great historian. That guy knows as much about Oregon history as anybody. And um, he, I think I just want to thank him for his public service because he's been really a great Senate president. But let's just take him because he is now leaving the scene. We can just look for a minute and see where the money is here. So Peter's going out of the legislature with a little over a quarter million dollars in his account. This we pulled last night. It's all there. All you got to do is research it. Then you can see who might have contributed. So the highest political contribution looks like $3,000 here from the Oregon Hospital Political Action Committee. Oregon Beverage Recyclers, another 3000 So this stuff is there. And my point is, if you become good at the, re the publicly available research, you can find this. And you can say, well, you know, these are things that this legislator cares about generally. That's important to know in terms of their back, back, uh, background and kind of profile. So we're going to recruit our champion. Who's going to introduce our bill? Who's going to co-sign it? Then we're going to build coalitions and look for opinion leaders. So what other organizations are working in this area? We're going to identify them. We're going to find their leadership and get them to help us articulate the need for our carbon sequestration bill. 
And uh, we're going to then identify and access who the decision makers are. So there's always this nexus between legislators, agencies, public agencies, and industries. So always you, you think about the, the nexus of those three. So in terms of carbon uh, issues, I would think we would go to the DEQ. And there's probably a person at the DEQ who has worked on Oregon's Climate Action Plan. And I would figure out who this staff person is who wrote that plan. And I believe there is a plan exactly by that name. And I would get them on the phone and say, interested in sequestration, Eastern Oregon, who are the top five people I should talk to? So see how we use that to help identify who the decision makers are. And then critically important is to get leadership support. So in this case, you probably go to the Energy and Environment Committee chair, which in the past has been Senator Dembro in the Senate, and then on the House, it's been Representative Marsh this last short session. And you'd go to them and you'd say, I've got this great carbon bill. How does this fit in what your leadership priorities are? And this is how you get the bill moved. Because in the Oregon system, it's the chair of the committee who's going to say, yes, you get a hearing, or no, you don't get a hearing. So that's kind of how you do that. You see how this all kind of fits together? So if you don't do the good research first, you'll never be able to make the good argument to talk to the right person in order to get the bill moving. This is where your hummingbird comes in. <laughs> So you are going to be messaging through many, many media. These days, Twitter is super important. All sort of forms of social media are totally there. Back when I was starting, we would type up news releases, get them out to the news media. But there's very few working reporters nowadays. So really, it's about social media, more journalism. Although I have to tell you, I love journalists. And journalists, to me, have always been helpful in framing public issues and getting information out to the public. So, you know, I wanted to say, I believe a journalist is your friend until you find out otherwise by a bad story, and then you forgive them because they're gonna be there the day after anyway. So, so you don't ever get mad and ask for a retraction. You go, okay, well, we didn't agree on that one, but move on. But anyway, it's very important that you get the messaging out through all the various means. You talk to the hummingbirds. So. We're going to go to a member, hey, I'm doing a bill on carbon sequestration. Can I have your support? What are your questions? And they're going to say, this is critically important. Give me the reasons for and against this bill. So who can give me three reasons for the bill and three reasons why you wouldn't want the bill? Are we out of time? No, we got time. OK, three reasons for the bill. And you, I know you got this, but. Let's, let's try some other people. Why would we be for this bill? Less carbon emissions will slow the process of global warming. So right. we have less fossil fuels we put into the environment, we'll have a safer planet. Excellent. Beautiful job. That's great. Who else would give me a reason for the bill? Hey, you saved some tax money. We'd reach out to rural Oregon. Yes. It could, this is a benefit to people who live in the eastern part of the state. OK. Any other reasons? OK, why would we not want this bill? It's based from legislation that's not representative of the area it's from. Yeah. So it only applies to Eastern Oregon. What about most of the Oregonians who live in Western Oregon? They get kind of left out, uh, at least of the tax part of it. But they, they do breathe and drink water, so they have other benefits that may offset, you know? Right? So um, OK, what else? What's another argument against the bill? Well, this is a really big bill. Go ahead, please. You know how you said the carbon sink part? Yeah. Is that so? That's there's nothing bad about those. Like there's no like downfall to them. Right. Or because um, maybe if there was anything bad that could happen, that would be a downfall. To that's a good maybe point. Maybe like the installing of them and stuff. So like it that. could create like other environmental hazards. Maybe that's land that we're going to need later for something else. And if we use it as a carbon sink, then that might take that out of production, or they're even worse, there might be other unintended consequences that we haven't found out because we don't have adequate research, which is why we'd probably want to get on the phone to OSU or somebody, or WOU, thank you very much, and ask their carbon uh, people that, uh, what, what are we doing, you know, and what are you studying and what do we have for that? 
Okay, so the, the good legislator will ask you to argue this uh, both ways. So I can't tell you the number of times a legislator has said to me, Greg, you've got to tell me who's for it, who's against it, good reasons for it, good reasons against it. If you're a prepared advocate, you can argue both sides. Not that you're going to argue both sides, but what I would always say is, okay, these are the reasons for, these are the reasons a person might be against this, but in balance, it's always better to be for my idea than against my idea. So, yeah, so it is persuasive, but it's also balanced in terms of the approach. At that point, you have your legislative vehicle introduced, so your champion is gonna take the bill, drop the bill. All bills in the Oregon legislature are drafted by Office of Legislative Council. Don't try to have somebody's lawyer say, oh, here, let me fix your bill for you. No, it's always gotta be the legislature's lawyer, and they do that for good public policy reasons. And then you prepare your written and oral testimony. So you would probably put together a package, a press release. You probably have talking points, which is in one page. If you just happen to step on the elevator with the representative from, say, Ontario, Oregon, what would be the three things you would say to him in that elevator or her? What would you say to her in that elevator? These are the three arguments that you would give. So it's literally, that's the hummingbird part. You have to be able to say, this is a really good bill, addresses the problem, it's gonna be good for your constituents, you know, and it's not gonna cost the state that much. Plus, think of the cost if we don't deal with the problem. So literally, that's about as quick a time as you have with them. So you have to be prepared and well-researched. Okay, so then you have a public hearing, and at this hearing, numbers matter. So, I mean, we have been in this horrible online hearing situation where, you know, interest groups are just having people turn in one or two sentence uh, things. A lot of times they're cookie cutter and they're not very sincere. What you always want is a personal, sincere statement by a person that says, I've been an Oregonian for X amount of years, you know, the environment's a huge problem. We have to do something about carbon. This is a good step forward, please vote yes. So that's the kind of thing that you wanna make sure you get in the record. And then generally, I like to organize panels when I'm pushing a bill. So I'll have two or three people, normally two or three legislators to lead the panel, and then a panel of citizens who will talk about it. So I don't necessarily get up and testify. I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the coach of the team not the quarterback. It's the citizens who need to make the argument. Because frankly, the citizens see me day in, day out. They wanna see if other people outside the building really care about this bill. So that's why, we, that's why we work with our citizens. We teach them about the bill. We make sure they're comfortable with the arguments. We, and then we, get them, we ask them to have the courage to sit there at the dais and have their two or three minutes before the committee. So that's what we do, we turn out our supporters and then we schedule a vote. And vote counting is an art, making sure votes are accurate. A lot of times we have wishful thinking in vote counting. So you always have to kind of stress test your vote, your vote count to make sure that nothing's changed. But I always, um, like there's always some legislator who kind of the last person they hear from will change their mind. So that's why you want to be the last person they hear from. Uh, on the issue, and so vote counting is kind of an art form, and we can we can talk about that uh, probably in a different place. There is me in action with Senator Kim Thatcher, and that's the Wilsonville Citizens Academy, a great civic engagement effort that the city puts together. I take a team of um, people. So these are just plain citizens from Wilsonville who come down with me to the Capitol when the Capitol. You know, before COVID <laughs> and hopefully soon after, uh, and come down and I, I take him to the Capitol, give him the tour, meet with some legislators. And in this case, we are here talking to Senator Thatcher, I think about the Boone Bridge. This is about the $550 million bridge across the Willamette. We're trying to rebuild at Wilsonville, which is just about as old as I am and, and not as good a shape as I am. So. Anyway, hopefully we're gonna get the money for the new bridge, so. I think that's about it. So what I say about the hummingbird here is that we advocate, we advance our cause, and we repeat. We celebrate our victories, big and small. We thank our people, or we thank our champions, our coalitions, and we get ready for the next virtual cycle. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have the opportunity to change the world. And as the hummingbird does, I hope that you do. And I'll see you in Salem. Thank you. Are there any questions? I don't think you talked about how did you get into lobbying? So I wanted to make a living, and I didn't want to run for office. So I'd already run as student body president at U of O, which frankly was kind of a lot of work, and um, you know, was elected office. So um, the other thing is I'm more interested in policy. So this is a gross generalization, but a rule of thumb I use, and that is there's two kind of people in politics. There's the kind of people who want to be somebody, and then there's the kind of people that want to do something. And so I've always been the kind of person that wants to do something. I didn't need to you know, have the title. Um, and so how I got in was I worked my way in. I mean, starting at the U of O, you just kind of signed up for ASUO as a student activity. And they were saying, well, we have tuition problems in Salem that the state board, fire education, which at the time had more control over tuition. Now it's, of course, each university has their own board. But um, tuition, this is during Vietnam. Peop a lot of people were coming back from Vietnam. And they were saying, we're spending a lot of money on tuition. So we need to have some control. So we organized a student uh, group, and we went to Salem. And we found we were extremely well received because uh, at that time, because of the arguments against the Vietnam War, the campuses were burning. There was like riots. A lot of uh, people were tear gassed. We had a bombing at the U of O. So when the student leaders showed up, the legislators went, what the heck is going on on campus? You know? And we were then able to be able to talk to them to say, students have rights. And students are consumers and therefore need to be respected. And so that's how we started. Um, we kind of leveraged off of the anti-war movement. Uh, this is, remember, and the Vietnam was still going on until 75, and this was 71 and 73 sessions. So we used that as a way to kind of start the process. And then once you start the lobby, it's like I enjoyed it. So I kept looking for ways to lobby. And then um, the way I got to Washington was even, I think, a more interesting story. I worked on the campaign, and I was paid a pittance. There was such a small amount. But then when I was in, uh, I went to the White House personnel office, and they said, well, did you work in the campaign? And I said, well, yes, I did. They said, well, without evidence, you'll never get a job. So I thankfully kept my pay stubs from the campaign, and I was able to submit that. And then the next day, I got a call and said, Mr. Leo, could you come in? We have something for you. <laughs> it's like, it was literally that quick. And so you'll laugh when you hear this, but they said, what do you know about the immigration issue? And I said, I know absolutely nothing about that issue. They said, perfect, you're our guy. Here's, your, here's where you go over at Justice to work on the issue. <laughs> and it was just totally just like that. And I go, OK, well, and I had to learn about the issue, which was great. Because what they didn't want was somebody had a preconceived notion. They wanted to have somebody who was going to kind of work with the various interest groups uh, in an even-handed way, which is what I think we did with the immigration bill in 86. So. The very first out-of-college job I had, I worked for free, because it was all the Tom McCall staff. Uh, it was Ed Westerdahl, Ron Schmidt, John Pius, and the guys who had all been Tom McCall's senior staff people. And they, you know, I was right out of the U of O, and they said, well, you know, we don't really have any money to pay you. And I said, look, I'll come and work for you for free for a month. And if I work out, then, you know, find some money and pay me. But if I don't work out, you can just send me on my way. And it was that hustle that gets you in the door. So, but you also have to work hard and perform. So, so I imagine not all, every bill you've brought has passed. And so I think there's really important lessons to be learned from failure. So what is some of the most important lessons you've learned? Yes, I, and there have been some just spectacular failures. <laughs> And, uh, and, you, and it is true, I think, that you learn more from bills that, you, that don't pass and that fail. And they fail largely because you don't do your homework. So maybe you haven't completely researched the issue. There may be arguments. Or it could be something in the context that you're working in that there's, you know, the legislators bring their own values and, you know, their own life experiences to that process. And 
maybe you didn't know that a certain legislator had already had some kind of experience with the bill. So those, those kinds of things. So I would say the majority of bills fail because of lack of homework and that people don't do their research. And they just kind of, you know, they have this idea that you can just kind of come in and BS your way uh, through it. And th th these people are experts at sniffing out people who don't know what they're talking about. So that's why I really emphasize you really know what you're doing before you, you know, so do the homework. But no, I've had some spectacular failures. And with a lot of bills, you fail the first time through because it's new material and people haven't got their mind made up on it. And so, I mean, I just, I'm not, I really don't like to talk about work I'm currently doing, but I just finished the bill in a short session, which was really controversial and spectacularly so. And we, you know, we hadn't, uh, last time it failed because of a procedural matter. It was that, you know, we were right at the, right at signy die and the other side that wanted to stop it filed a minority report and because you got to know the rules backwards and forwards and you know we had one day left in the session and we had a minority report takes two days so it was you know it's like we it's like in uh, basketball or football you weren't watching the clock and so you know that bill failed that session then we went to leadership and we said we really want to redo on this during the short session we were able to get it through but only after we had to fix the bill there was literally a fact in the bill that made the legislators uncomfortable. And so we knew we had to amend it, but it was so controversial, we couldn't um, fix it in the Environment Committee. It had to go to the rules uh, to get fixed. And so because I had been the rules administrator previously, I knew that's what we do with bills that we want but aren't perfect. So, but they has to be in a, a committee where you amend it. So we were able to uh, we had to do some really quick research and hats off to the legislator who saw that and uh, got a quick report done by the Office of Legislative Policy, which gave us exactly the right fact in order to get the bill passed. So, But no, it's like anything in life. It's like if you don't put time and caring attention into the, you won't get a good outcome. So hard work, 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration. That's what we try to do. So, yeah, and compromise, and being willing to say, I'll take 80%, thank you, and give the other guy 20%, or even if you have to, 50-50. So I wanted to end with just a joke. You know, my joke is there are three kinds of people in the world, you know? We know there's really two kinds of people, the kind that say there's two kinds of people and the kind that don't. But anyway, there's three kinds of people in the world. There's, you know, the, the people who make things happen. And so I, I really want to work with the people that want to make things happen. There's the kind of people that go, yeah, I just kind of want to know what's happening. And then there's people that go, what happened? And I, you know, I don't want anybody in this room to be that person that goes, what happened? I want you to be the person that makes things happen or watches things and, and knows about things that are happening. So. so I want to thank you very much for taking yeah. the time today because I know you're, you're really, really busy. And I know the session just ended, so I'm sure you're ready for some rest and relaxation before the next step. Thank so you. I want to uh, have, can all thank you very much for today. Thank you.